Hello and welcome to this webcast lecture in the History and Context of Journalism series here at the University of Winchester. My name is Andrew Giddings and today our subject is Philosophical Idealism, the early 19th century movement and ideas associated with Kant and Hegel. I have with me in the studio Chris Horry who gave a lecture today on this topic and I'm also joined by Julie Cordier, a student on the course. Immanuel Kant was born in Königsberg in 1724 and wrote two of the most influential books in the Western canon, The Critique of Pure Reason in 1781 and The Fundamentals of the Metaphysics of Morals in 1785. Hegel's influence is, if anything, even greater because of his association with German nationalism and also the career of his most famous follower Karl Marx, who we'll be looking at later. Chris, could you begin by assessing the importance of the material we were looking at today? I think it's it's very significant um, and way beyond the rather narrow sphere of philosophy. Uh, Kant, for example, uh, and his ideas on the nature of the universe, very influential in modern theoretical physics uh, in ways that we can perhaps explore. But in the area of morality, uh, his influence has been absolutely enormous and I think there's a very important practical aspect to this for journalists above all because he's concerned and he puts central to his moral system um, subjective ideas of honesty and I personally take this directly from Kant when I'm thinking about my own work and uh, teaching students as well in the area of law and ethics which I do here at the university that we can never really know the truth of any matter objectively we might be misled we might make an honest mistake or, or the, what we're trying to report about might the facts might not be fully re revealed yet but we always know when we're being honest um, you know generally speaking I'm not a great uh, fan of metaphysics but I, I he's undeniably onto something here Kant I, I do believe it's true that people, uh, assuming that all people are the same, therefore another person is much like me, does know when we are being honest and does know when we're being dishonest and we can measure with some degree of precision uh, how far we are living up to or departing from our own standards in that respect. So I think he's a, a very he's a very difficult, complex uh, thinker. Um, it, covering a span from theoretical physics through morality uh, and politics and technical philosophy itself. Um, so one of the leading thinkers of the 19th century, somebody involved in setting the intellectual climate of that period and certainly somebody we need to try and acquaint ourselves with uh, here at, at the university. Uh, last week we've talked about utilitarianism uh, in the previous lecture. Uh, can we, can you tell us about uh, Kant's philosophy of morality, how different it is from utilitarianism? The exact opposite. Uh, we discussed previously utilitarianism. Um, the, the essence there, people like Bentham and Mill, is that the general good is achieved when each person pursues their own selfish or enlightened selfish self-interest. That by each of us striving for the most utility, utility is a technical word they use for something like satisfaction or happiness, by uh, doing that we will bring about uh, the general good. Uh, the phrase is, uh, you, you know, a moral act is that which, in utilitarianism, a moral act is that which brings about the greatest good for the greatest number of people, regardless uh, of intentions. So somebody can have really quite devious and evil intentions, but if it, if it, if it results in, you know, general good, then it's a moral act for the utilitarians. Kant is completely opposite to that. He's not interested in the circumstances uh, in which you make a moral decision and he's not interested in the outcome he's only interested in the subjective intention famously he says it's better that the whole world should perish than a person should tell a lie he recognizes that people will tell lies and so on that they will depart from these standards which he believes are are known internally 
um, to everybody. He calls it the moral law within that every person um, has uh, has this within them. He also, therefore, by the way, I didn't quite touch upon this on the lecture, but I wanted to do so. Um, he sees this internal moral intuition as a as a proof of his of his entire system. He also sees it as a proof of the validity of democracy and equal rights and human rights because he believes everybody has these same moral sensibilities. The utilitarians think that it's not proven that everybody would have these internal moral senses. They're only going to judge people on their action, for example, in the economic marketplace. You know that people really want this outcome. They want to buy this thing rather than that thing by how much money they're prepared to spend on it, for example. And that's an objective standard of what those people think is morally right for them or what they desire. Um, so that involves the idea that people are not equal, that you can tolerate inequality. And of course, one consequence of liberal economics is that, is that it, it not only tolerates inequality, but even uh, sees it as a positive good. Kant wouldn't see that. Um, his, the political implications of his system is that everything should be shared equally. Everybody must be treated absolutely equally uh, all the time. Fantastic. And, and Chris, um, on the subject of um, the physics or metaphysics, um, in contrast to some other um, philosophers, um, you mentioned in the lecture that Kant asserts that things must always exist in some way, whether or not they're being perceived at any time, and that we know this through intuition. Um, for example, if you leave a room, then you know that everything that was in the room when you were there is still there after you leave. And I notice a parallel with modern quantum physics, which is full of theories such as dark matter and the Higgs boson, things which we're not, unable to perceive, but it's asserted that they must exist because we can see their effects. Can you just discuss this parallel a little bit more with us, please? Right. Well, we're covering a lot of territory there, and I think that there's two things in there. First, first of all, there is the perception issue and um, the problem of the nature of the unperceived object. So Kant is very interested in what are objects like if they are not perceived. And here he's in a sort of dialogue with the empiricists who were deeply troubled by this this problem that the empiricists generally speaking are the people who um, only believe that uh, objects are there when they are being perceived um, that led them into some very strange positions of so George Berkeley the philosopher believed that objects literally disappeared or ceased to exist when you weren't uh, observing them and that they flashed back into existence and what kept them, where they went, was, in, was into the kind of mind of God. Now, Kant has a more sophisticated answer to that problem, uh, which is that things have a dual nature, that they have a phenomenal nature when we're observing them, and a noumenal nature, or kind of potential, when they're not being observed. That when they're not being observed, they are things in themselves. And we will never be able to describe those things because they exist in a noumenal realm that's separate to the realm of ordinary perception. Now this all sounds very, very strange to, to us in our day-to-day -day life because we do depend on those habits of mind that if I go out of 